very much. Um, thank you very much, um, Madam President and Vice President and special guests. Um, can I add my welcome to Helen's to everybody? We are absolutely delighted to have this conference in Trinity. And um, I'm stunned at the size of it. And, and I can already feel the passion as I walk around and, and the kind of engaged feeling of everybody here. Um, so Helen asked me to talk a little bit about research for society. Um, so I thought I'd just say a very small few words uh, about how research matters to us in Trinity. And actually, Helen, you've already done a fantastic job of describing uh, our research. I think I should bring you everywhere with me to do that. Um, but it's an enormous part of our identity. I often say it's part of our DNA. Um, our three faculties, they're all engaged in research. Uh, we work nationally and internationally. And as Helen mentioned already, um, 100 million of our 300 million income is, is, is focused on research. So it's, it's, it's an enormous part of what we do. Um, I suppose it's really important. This actually is my favorite picture of the library. I know the long room is just beautiful, but I find this even more beautiful. And it is one of those buildings that Helen often says divides people. Um, but I use it here because, uh, for me, the library is hugely at the centre of the research. Now, it's at the centre in very obvious ways. We have amazing collections here, and our students and staff use those um, as part of their research. But it's at the centre much more than that. So the library here are hugely engaged and have been very, very active in forming our research strategy. Helen sits on our research committee, which is at the heart of, of how we drive research in the university. And in fact, actually, I would say, and I'm going to come back to this at the end, drives many of the ideas that are really, really core to how we tackle research going forward. So they're very, very much at the heart of it. So, it is easy for me to say that research matters. Obviously, it matters to me. I'm the Dean of Research here. It's in my title. Um, and of course, all researchers and all academics, I'm sure you're well aware, apart from thinking we're the center of the universe, all think that our research is the most important. So um, if, you know, if, you look at, if you look at gene therapies, you say, of course, it matters in, 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 in you know, uh, curing people. If you look at people who look at climate change, as we spoke about already, you can say, of course, it matters. It really matters to the world. We tackle these problems. If you look at people focused on you know, culture and identity and immigration, of course, it matters to some of the greatest issues that are tackling our, uh, facing our society. But actually, most of the time, we are kind of standing in a bubble. And I don't know whether you can see the slide very clearly, but there's a person behind there, and it's hard to see them. And, and it is the case that we constantly, and I think rightly so, have to explain why research matters and why society should value it. And I suppose in my time in this role, I think one of the main learning points for me is that you will never make the one killer argument that finally ends that discussion, and it's something that we have to do all the time you know, to decision makers and to taxpayers uh, whose money gets invested in research. And I suppose what we have seen over the last decade is a rise in what we call EP&E, education and public engagement, where there's been a huge focus on how we talk to society in general and use better language and different stories to explain our research. So that's been a, there's been a huge growth in that. And what you see now um, is you see that the funding bodies themselves um, re-emphasize the value of research by actually naming things research for society. So if you look at our own funding bodies nationally, if you take something like Science Foundation Ireland, we have research for society and research for the economy. If you look at Europe, you see this kind of nomenclature everywhere, where it's trying to re-emphasize time and time again that research matters to society. And if you look at how we're talking about research challenges these days, you'll hear terms like grand societal challenges and missions, where there's a huge emphasis on trying to talk about research in a way that the wider world will care about and understand. And I think that's all very, very good. So what we've seen is a shift, I suppose, in talking about research in the economy to talking about research in society. But I think the most exciting shift that's happened is the shift that's about for and with society. And if you look at a lot of the material emerging now, it's all about engaged research that kind of shifts the dial where we as researchers go out into the world and find different kind of collaborators. 
So we're all used to uh, collaborators of other prestigious universities and organizations. And the for and with movement really is about understanding that those collaborators come in increasingly diverse forms and that we engage with those in different ways. So I want to spend a little time talking about how you do research for and with society and then come back at the end to why that matters for libraries and why you might need to think of things a little bit differently. So there are absolutely many fantastic examples of people doing this and doing this for a long time already. Um, the whole area of citizen science has already been mentioned, and I'm just pick, I've just picked one example. There are many fantastic examples around the world. A, a platform I like is a platform called Zooniverse. Um, and what Zooniverse does, uh, and I'm sure there are many people here who are well versed in the notion of citizen science, Zooniverse puts projects online that the wider world can engage in uh, and do. So what you're saying is you're saying uh, citizens at large can get a taste of what it's like to do research. And I think what's really, really interesting in this space and what you've seen happen certainly over the last few years, that this would have started very firmly in the science side of things. But if you look at the Zooniverse platform here, you will see that the projects go across history and literature, biology, a whole mix of things. And I think that's really, really important. And you'll increasingly see actually libraries who've got very, very interesting collections, who want some kind of analysis done on those collections, putting them up there and allowing citizens to help in that. So that to me is one layer of doing research, I suppose, with, uh, uh, not just for. This, I think, can be taken to a much deeper level. And another example I, I really love is the organiz organization Sense About Science. So I'm not sure if people know that organization here, but it's a fantastic, it's an independent charity based in the UK. And that organization basically provokes people into asking for evidence about how decisions are made in public life. So they challenge misrepresentation of science and research and findings. And you know, they get people to say, OK, show me the evidence for that decision. And I think what they're actually doing here is they're training the wider world to have a research eye, which I think is really, really important. I recently went to a fantastic workshop they had about how we encourage our MEPs in Europe to make research-informed decisions. And it's quite a challenging task, but there are resources there, and it is up to us, I suppose, to voice our desire for that to happen. So this, this is another level of research with. So you're encouraging people to think in different ways and have different levels of, I suppose, a demand in society. In fact, actually, one of the women who works in Sense About Science told me that some of the tabloid newspapers got sick of people asking for evidence and peer review evidence from one of the campaigns they were running. So I thought that was a really, really good, good sign of a change. So the third example I want to give here is one that's based in Trinity. I feel I have to give an example based in Trinity because I'm very proud of the work we do. And it's the work around aging. So we have a long history, um, no pun intended, of looking at aging in, in Trinity uh, with some fantastic researchers in the space. And this particular aging project uh, I've picked out is an aging project that focuses on people who are aging who also have intellectual disabilities, in particular Down syndrome. And there's a really stark uh, figure there where it, for, the, for people with Down syndrome who are at risk of dementia, and at the age of 65 people, there's 88% risk of, of dementia with Down syndrome as distinct from 4.3 to 8% in the general population, which is really, really stark. But what I love about this example is this is research for society, for a group that are often neglected, because when we do research, oftentimes we do research for kind of bigger, more mainstream areas. But it's also research with a group that often don't have a voice at all. And, and the reason why this is such a powerful example is because from the get-go, from the outset of this research project, everything was designed, the research framework, the research values, everything was designed with the people who were involved. Um, there's longitudinal studies where the relationships were built up over many years. And this year, actually, the first memory clinic designed with people from this background opened in Ireland for people with Down syndrome. Um, and as you can see here as well, it's also influenced policy and made changes in how we do things. So this is an amazing example, I think, of the for and with society and the shifts that we're seeing. And I think it's kind of fairly straightforward to say, obviously, you know the problems best if you're experiencing them from a day-to-day -day basis and you're able to feed into that in many ways. 
So there are some great examples, I think, of showing how for and with society is emerging. So I want to spend a little bit of time speaking about the area that I come from. So I'm an engineer, and I, I've used this kind of picture of messy noise. I, I come from wireless, wireless communications background. And usually I spent all of my time looking for a picture to describe my research, but usually it's nothing. There's, the, there's wireless. Um, and on top of that, um, I come from a world where people only notice something has gone wrong when it stops working, like when you can't get on your phone or, your, or the internet's down. So in this world, one of the interests I have, uh, and I was very interested in, in, in uh, um, the president mentioned, um, uh, is the Internet of Things. And I thought I would talk a little bit about the Internet of Things. It's very fourth industrial revolution related. So for people who don't know the definition of the Internet of Things, it's simply about taking everything in the world that you can think of, seats, people, cows, grass, embedding centers in them, gathering data from those sensors, processing that data, and making decisions. So you can make many different decisions, and the next slide I'm using is from, it just happens to be from one company that, that provides sensors, Libellium. Uh, and it's a very useful slide because it shows the different kind of things you can kind of make decisions about. So this is a smart city focused example. The idea here is that the sensors are all around the city. Uh, it might be simple decisions that need to be made, like I am looking for a parking spot. If I'm directed to a parking spot um, uh, really quickly and efficiently, I will reduce congestion. So you can use sensors to do that. It might be something about environmental pollution and controlling that and turning things on and off. Um, it could be things about security. It could be things about predictive policing. There's a whole range of things that happen in this space. So when I describe it in terms of applications, people can join in in the conversation. And you know, there's, there's, there's a possibility to kind of have a, a deep conversation about it. But very soon, if you're an engineer or you're in a group of people who are normally involved in the design of this kind of world, these are the kind of words that start to emerge. So maybe I say pe most people probably have heard of 5G by now, especially because a lot of people are complaining about 5G at the moment. But there are a lot of words there that are normal words for, for, for the world I come from. Um, and people obviously will have heard of AI and artificial intelligence, but explainable AI and the kind of the algorithmic I say, processes behind them they start to become part of the conversation really, really quickly. So if you want a deep conversation about this world, you enter into this. So I suppose the question that we try to ask is we say, okay, how do we do with in this kind of world? So there's fantastic with and for society in areas to do with, say, patient, public patient involvement. And I think you can see where, where, where people understand how they're directly affected and develop that vocabulary to talk about it. But it is much harder in this kind of world. And essentially what I see is I see the movement in kind of open scholarship and the movement in public engagement and the movement in citizen science is helping push this along. And the way that we tackle it in my group, so I have a group that OMG is the name of the group, Orthogonal Methods Group, so they work with engineers. It's not OMG. <laughs> uh, they work with engineers, and, um, and they're mainly artists and designers, and we take a very creative practice-based approach to this. So it's just one approach, but it's an approach I thought I, I would talk through for a little bit, because I think it really matters in the kind of messages kind of for the libraries of the future. So, there are four different things I want to talk about in the context of the kind of creative practices and the way that we approach this. So the first thing really is a lot of the work we do is about making things that are invisible, visible. And, and that is the reality in the world that we live in today. We are so used to technological change that it becomes very invisible to us. So the things I'm going to mention here are, are work that other people have done, as well as work that some people in my group have done and, and various things like that. Uh, so the first, I love this book. It's, it's by uh, an academic and artist, Ingrid Burrington, and it's called Networks of New York. And she actually has gone around New York City and mapped out all of the hidden networks. So obviously there are some signs of infrastructure, but you know she's looked at like where you're standing on top of the internet connections, where you know where wireless space stations are, and it's a really interesting read because it gives you a different perspective. And we've done similar things ourselves. This is some people from from Trinity out mapping 
various places around uh, uh, and looking at where cables go and, and how the infrastructure uh, kind of sits around us. And this is a really, really, I think, important thing to do. It's called actually infrastructure tourism, believe it or not, and people, people would be interested in anything. And, um, uh, it, it, but it's a really, really good way. You see it a lot as well. It's used very tactically and politically when people do infrastructure tourism around data centers and they draw attention to a variety of the, the structures that, that we need to see exist in our landscape. But there's also the bit that's behind the bit that you can't see. And a project that I absolutely do adore at the moment is a project that actually looks, it's not anything we did, it's a group of artists elsewhere, but it's a project that looks and asks the question, what can I not see that is behind the Amazon Echo? So I have one of these at home, um, and it, this project has really made me think, am I right to have it at home? So it's a project called The Anatomy of an AI System. It's actually in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, and Kate Crawford and Vlad and Joler are the two artists. And as it says, it's an anatomical case study of the Amazon Echo as an artificial intelligence system made of human labor. And that's the really, really interesting thing. So the pictures I have now in no way do it justice, and I would highly recommend that everyone kind of delves into them. But what they've done, they have created, in reality, this image is the size of the screen here, and they have mapped out every single mineral, every single object in it, where it comes from, every single piece of labor that is put into it. The labor we put in, you know, the kind of free crowdsourced labor we put in, the expert labor that goes into the designers, um, the materials that are used in it. And it is a fascinating example of looking behind the scenes and making things that are invisible visible. And I have just a little few zoom-ins, again, you can't see, but they, they go through the mineral table and they pick out, we'll say, the, 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 the minerals that are in danger, uh, are conflict minerals that are used in it, or, or where they come from. Um, and they look at things like immaterial labor, crowdsourced labor, and all sorts of other things and how they all go to this. And there's kind of one key sentence in the essay that they write with, they, 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 that accompanies it. And it basically says something along the lines, when you do a simple task, like turn on or off a light, or ask what the time is, you're actually harnessing planetary resources to do that. And it's really, really interesting to think of that invisibility and that system that sits behind it. So a, a lot of our work and, and the work we reference is very much about saying, okay, you need to look closer the invisible digital world around you needs, physical and digital world around you, needs to be brought attention to. That's the first thing. The second thing we do is we stress that there is absolutely no such thing as neutral design. This is an absolute principle that I really, really believe in. So to give you two examples here, just to give you the sense of it, one goes back in time, and this might be well known, a lot of people here might know this, but Kodak film, you could say, how can film not be neutral? So the Kodak film was designed in the 40s and 50s to be really well attuned to, to pale skin. So there's fantastic images online where you will see photographs of people with darker black skin and they merge into the background and you can't see them because the physical chemicals are attuned to white skin. And this is the thing called the Shirley card. I always find it really funny, but the, my favorite bit of it is the word normal. So that is what normal is. <laughs> and obviously I'm abnormal because I'm red in the, in the face a lot. But it's very, very interesting to see. And that is an example of the lack uh, that, I'm not saying anything is right or wrong, I'm saying it's not neutral, okay? Um, my favorite example, and the example I bore people to death with, is the Camden bench. I don't know whether anyone of us has ever seen this, but it is a bench designed in Camden in London. And this bench stops 23 behaviors. So you can't graffiti on it, you can't ram it with the car, you can't skateboard on it. Really importantly, you can't sleep on it. So it's a fantastic example of where they don't have to say, homeless people can't sleep here, it's just not physically possible. So what you have is you have a physical object into which social laws are built. Um, and I think this is really, really, really interesting. So our point in the way we think about the digital world, where it, the, the images I showed you of the smart city earlier, of all of the sensors and all of the things that are happening, social laws are being built into that world. And I often use a very, very simple example. You can have smart traffic lights that direct traffic, and for example, you know, in the middle of the night, they change more rapidly, so, because there's less cars around. 
but you could also have smart traffic lights that direct traffic away from salubrious areas towards poorer areas. They put up with the pollution. You don't have to if you live in a better off area. And this might happen on purpose or it might happen by mistake. And essentially, you need to be able to understand the neutrality of design or lack of neutrality of design to get this. And there's a very famous statement from uh, Lawrence Lessig. It says, code is law. And essentially, it's, it's, it's saying social behaviours become law if they're embedded in the code, the hardware and the software of the system. And then you just have to accept it. So that's the second thing we do. We really try to emphasise this whole idea of there's no such thing as neutral design. Then the third thing we do, which is really, really important, is we need to give people vocabulary to talk about things. And that is quite difficult. You know, I mean, I, I also think for us, actually in academic settings, we think some things are very ordinary ways of discussing things now, um, but it's really, really important to do this. And again, I'm just giving you some examples of the way to do it that kind of draw on creative practices. So one of those examples, we, we recently had a, a staging of this fantastic play here in Trinity, the Trinity Longham Hub staged it. And this play had two participants, that woman there, and Siri on your phone, on your iPhone. And it was a live interaction between that person and Siri. And it exposed various different things about the algorithm and how Siri works. It's really interesting, apparently, I, I learned that Siri is different in different languages. So Siri is more well behaved in English because it has been trained more in English and it can still say slightly more crazy things. Apparently in French it's much more romantic. I wasn't at all surprised to hear that. <laughs> but, but it's really, really, really interesting to see the kind of personality that has emerged in it. There's lots of other ways of doing things. This is, I put this in, this is a, a student of mine did this a number of years ago because the word library was in it. Um, so she used the human library approach. So you know when you can go and take a book out of a library? In this library you can take a human out of a library and you can actually kind of spend time with that human and get to know things. And in this particular case she was looking at designing and development for the city, uh, a sustainable city. So she had all sorts of actors, whether they were architects, city planners, bin men, um, um, uh, people who sold things on the streets involved in this library and you could kind of take one out and spend time with them. And it's another way of kind of developing a vocabulary. And then as a final example, within my own group, we have a, we have a, 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 a Jessica Foley came up with this amazing thing called engineering fictions. It's kind of a play on, on those words, but it's a writing workshop. And we use creative writing for people to be able to talk through stories about how technology affects uh, and impacts their lives. And one of the things that this is fantastic for is you will notice very often when you're in a particular discipline, you get locked into the vocabulary of your discipline. And you probably see that in the libraries as well. But this allows you to actually break out of being locked into that and maybe embrace different kind of vocabulary, which not alone allows you to talk about the, 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 the material, allows you to think differently and, and, and rethink things about technology. So there are many, many things you can do, and there are just some examples, but you have to say to yourself, okay, vocabulary, language matters, and we need to think about it. And then finally, the fourth thing we do, and I have, uh, there, there's little slides in this, is uh, try to affect change. And that is really, really difficult. So the example I gave you earlier of the IDS tilde, they have really affected change. They've influenced policy, they have done things like uh, created the dementia center for uh, the memory clinic for people with uh, Down syndrome. Um, and in this world, I find it a bit harder. So there's two kinds of changes we would like to affect. So first of all, in the world of policy, and we do that, and we're doing it a lot through working think with, for example, Dublin City Council, getting them to think how they go about allowing the city to be, become smarter. There's big smart Dockland projects here. But essentially as well, we also want to affect change in big companies. And that's actually the very, as, as we all know, even when it comes to open scholarship, that is the difficult thing when you want to change the behaviors of large companies who are very powerful interests. And, and ultimately in the world that we live at the moment, uh, you know, when you look at uh, especially the climate action, um, ultimately while we can all do our bit, the bottom line comes down to a large industry needs to change how they do things. So, so this to me is very close to our heart and there's a huge amount to do in that yet. So there are the four kind of ways. We try to make things that are invisible visible. We really, really emphasize the thing that there's no such thing as neutral design. I mean, we, a lot of times I'm not saying it's right or wrong that something's designed in a particular way. We're saying at least be aware of it. 
uh, we make sure that people can have the vocabulary to express it and ultimately we affect change through trying to influence policy, which I have to say the library is hugely helpful with um, and that's kind of the way we think of it. So I just want to bring that back then in the last few minutes. Where are we and what does this and where does the library fit in all of this? So when I think about research, the way I would describe this is that research is evolving in so many angles and ways that we've kind of broken out of a straitjacket of what it looks like to do traditional research. Now in saying that, I am not saying, I, I, absolutely it's so important to have rigor, uh, repeatability, you know, et cetera, et cetera, in all of the research that we do, whatever the kind of methodologies we use. But the whole idea that something neatly fits into a publication, neatly fix it, fits into a book, or neatly fits on a shelf, you know, it's long ago, uh, long ago shattered and increasingly been shattered. And on top of that, we've developed a much more sophisticated and nuanced understanding of what impact means. And I think those things are very, very important. And while I didn't explicitly mention open scholarship, they are key parts of this. So for me, when I look at the future of research on, and open scholarship, on one side you have the, and I don't mean just in any disrespectful way, just, uh, just sort out open access. And on the other side, you have completely and utterly radically alter academic life as we know it and the, and the way research plays out in the world. And we, as a community, are trying to decide where on that spectrum we want to land. And for me, the really interesting thing, and I echo the statements that were made at the start of this, it is the most exciting time for libraries, because libraries have huge amounts of things to say in that space. Our library helps us understand what open scholarship means. Our library helps us capture impact in all of the new and weird and wonderful ways that it exists. But most importantly, the library is a part of the process that is about making this, I, th I, I suppose a glib word would be have the status it deserves, but taking it seriously, rather than it just being this fluffy other stuff that sits around the side. So I put this picture of the library back in the end. Um, it's at the heart of what we're doing here in driving the Open Scholarship agenda. We have this amazing uh, year-long unboxing Open Scholarship events that Helen, thanks to Helen, that we're doing, which is allowing us to explore these themes. But this stuff is quite fundamental to everything a researcher does. How have you, our researcher views themselves and the status, and it's fundamental to the kick that some research is needed in getting, getting out there and doing research for and with society and really, really making impact. So my very final slide, I've robbed a slide from, which is a bad thing to do in front of a bunch of librarians who check copyright, from an old, an old um, campaign, and so Irish people here will get this. And, and essentially there is a lot done and, and there's much, much, much more to do. And when I look at here and I look at the kind of things you do, I see a lot of that done. And I certainly see it here in Trinity and, and, and we wouldn't be as far as we are without the library. There is much, much more to do, but I think it's really, really exciting and it was great to have this opportunity to say these few words to you. Thank you. Thanks again to Linda for, for his very vivid and quite inspiring talk. And I think that now colleagues from the room would like to ask you some questions about your okay. incredible presentation. Do I just so, throw this at somebody if they want to ask a question? Yeah, yeah. So, so we have a tradition. <laughs> we have a tradition. This is a mic. Yeah. And we throw it through the room to someone who wants to talk. Okay, so, and not so, someone who doesn't want to talk. <laughs> <laughs> so colleagues, any, any question go. to Linda? Uh, uh, no worries if not. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> yeah. Catch it, catch it. Up. Well, Stuart asked the question because of the box. Um, Linda, I think... Um, You're speaking it. Oh, you speak? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> now I see the purpose. Yeah. I thought it's it was just to hit things. people. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I think something about the hidden bias and hidden labour that's really re relevant for libraries is in um, the special collections and uh, what we choose to keep and collect and what society chooses uh, or decides is uh, valuable and should be donated, collected, kept. And in the end, in 100 years time, that's history because that's all we'll have. So um, I think this idea of challenging us on our own hidden biases and the labor, the decisions we make, um, particularly for libraries as a really, really um, important foundational question. Oh, <laughs> well, I think you, I, I mean, I don't have much to answer to that and, and I, I, I completely agree with you. And I think, I mean, in one sense, you don't want to get analysis paralysis where you overthink every bias and everything. But I do think it is, uh, so, so one of the big things that comes up in the world I'm from is the political nature of measurement. And essentially, you know, uh, every measurement you make is politically contextualized and that actually goes through and we see it all the time especially we'll say in kind of uh, gender scenarios where where certain documents are considered more important and they would have excluded certain people from history as as a result of that so i agree with you that it is really really important to think like that um uh, uh, and it is, it is complicated as well because I realised when you're asking that question, some of the citizen science we do do is actually availing of crowdsourced labour in a kind of, um, I suppose, in, in a, a kind of precarious way that's encouraging that work further. But on the other hand, the libraries wouldn't actually survive without some of it either. So I think we're in a complex space ethically and morally. But I think for me, the message is be aware of it. And if you make whatever decision you make, you know you're making it, uh, rather than you're kind of making it by mistake, you know. Oh, there's a question. Oh, where are our <laughs> The throw. <laughs> yes, very good. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Hilda van Meijer, I'm from Amsterdam. Um, um, thank you very much for this inspiring talk. Um, uh, I, I, I told my colleague, I want this dean of research. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, the thing is, for most libraries, it's very difficult to get a good connection with your researchers. And recently, yeah. I've been told not to walk that much far ahead um, in front of the troops. Um, because most researchers aren't as innovative as you are, or as most of your group probably are, or, mm -hmm. or as some of the group are, should we hold back a little bit as research libraries, or should we not. keep on running? Yeah. But then the gap will be so yeah. large. What do you think? So I, 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 I think that I would say absolutely not, but there are ways that you can do it, right? So um, research institutions are typically really conservative. And also as well, people are, I think, very secure in the measurement system that's currently measuring them. And I'm not, like we have amazing researchers here using traditional metrics that are brilliant at what they do and those traditional metrics, you know, aren't lying in any way in the sense of, I can see that those people are great. But I think essentially what you're dealing with, with especially with open scholarship in this, is a huge level of insecurity as you go from one system to the other. And um, we've had um, Paul Ayres over talk about uh, UCL's uh, open press, and he says often, and Helen quotes him, the culture change is the biggest thing. So I would say absolutely not. Continue to be a disruptor, continue to put things in there but also understand that it is culture change. And the way I think, well, the way I think Helen and myself do it is you just need to spot the few open doors. So you only need four or five people. You need to start your gang. You need to get them into it. And it can help hugely if there's somebody who's good by traditional metrics in that mix. So if you get one of the perceived senior uh, academics who, who, you know, who publishes in, 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 in Nature or whatever it is and does, and they're involved in that, then you really push that. And we found actually most recently, you know, some of the talks we've had in Unboxing Open Scholarship have actually drawn in people that you say, okay, this person's worldwide respected. The fact they're talking about this is going to shift thinking. So don't stop, pick your battles wisely and get a few people who are on your side and that's all you need. Other questions? Yeah, yeah. We'll never get the thing yeah. up there. <laughs> this, this direction. No, no, just yeah. people will help. Yeah. Go. 
Yeah. yeah. This is an example of networking. Yeah, and, and, exactly. And, and rooting. Oh! <laughs> okay. Um, just a comment and then a question. My, um, my name is Stella Butler. I'm from the University of Leeds. Um, just a compliment on the ageing project. Um, because I wanted to learn about MOOCs, I did the, um, the ageing MOOC that you do from Trinity, and it was absolutely fantastic. I think it's just... Um, a wonderful uh, set of research that, that you've done there. So just compliments. I will tell them that, and thank you. Reinforcement. Uh, my question is around uh, what, what would make your, i.e. you as a researcher, what can libraries do? What would make your life better or what would enable um, open scholarship? What could we do that we don't do yeah. at the moment? Well, to be perfectly honest, I think a lot of the things that are, are in the offing and lined up to do are exactly the kind of things. So I think um, I, I, certainly the discussion about how do you capture alternative forms of research and in what way you do it is actually led in most cases that I see from the library side. Um, um, and I think so, so continuing that is good. Uh, embracing the altmetrics approach is good. Um, uh, but I also think what I, what I see is very, very good, uh, and this goes back to the, the there's no such thing as neutral design. I mean, you can use data any way you want, right? And you can prove anything, to be perfectly honest. You know, and I think exposing that, I mean, we are all locked into a certain way of, of measuring and, and, and doing data and kind of exposing, I suppose, the fact that, um, you know, to tell the full picture, you need multiple perspectives and that one slice of data only gives you one kind of view. So I think continuing, I mean, what I see when I look at the open science um, roadmap and when I look at things that are in there, I see all great things. So continuing to do those. Um, I think what's really, really, what I find frustrating with the open scholarship stuff myself, I'm not often able to give good enough examples of all, so for example, if you take the DORA initiative and, 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 uh, and you, you say you're not gonna use journal impact factors and you're not gonna do such and such a thing, there's never enough good so instead you can do such and such a thing and here's a good example of how you do such and such a thing. I'm still missing some of that in, in those stories. So, so as you develop those techniques to kind of fill out those stories of alternative ways of doing things I think is really, really important. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, Thomas Carsted from University of Southern Denmark. Very inspiring. What I would ask you, the next generation of researchers at all our universities are right inside our houses right now. It's students and it's coming generations in the educational system. Do you at Trinity have any reflections or any initiatives on how to engage your own students or yeah. perhaps students from schools or high schools yeah. or whatever? So I think that's a, a great question. So I just want to make one observation and give you one example. So it's an observation I've been using before. We have a fantastic competition here called the BT Young Scientist, where we have school kids who compete, who come up with the most amazing solutions to problems in the world. And, and the kid who won it last year, when I went over to his desk, he had a, a, what looked like an academic paper that he'd written on his desk. And I noticed that he had that on archive. He had it on an open. Uh, source, uh, an open platform. It didn't occur to him that you would actually write something and not share it with people. So we really believe the revolution does start with the people who are coming in at that side and kind of understand that, you know, things should be open um, and you can deal with things in a different way. So that, that's the first kind of comment. So the second thing, I think there's lots of different things you can do. One thing I have found is at some events I've been at with undergraduates, they kind of don't know what we're talking about because basically they start off being very open. We train them into being closed and narrow-minded. So they yet haven't been trained as postgrads into being clo more closed and narrow-minded. So they're going, what are you on about? So it can be hard sometimes to do things before they've actually hit the challenges. But one thing we're currently doing in Trinity, there are 21 different journals that have been instigated by either uh, undergrads or, or, or PhDs. And 
they're kind of, they've got, come organically. So what we've decided to do is first of all, get them all together to celebrate the fact that, you know, research is so much in their DNA that they're creating these things at an early age. I look and think, oh my God, what was I doing in college? Barely keeping up, whereas these people are just leading. And, and the second thing that we're doing is we're kind of looking at how that can be more formally open access and, and encouraging them to develop tools and skill sets that help them do that. And that's kind of part of starting the revolution, I suppose, from, from an earlier stage. And I mean, in, in a sense, they when we've had the first meetings already, I would have said uh, they kind of weren't fully aware of the kind of vocabulary we even use here, and that was a kind of starting the process. So we'll be doing a launch of that uh, in, in September of this year, but there's one example of that I'd highly encourage. Okay, we've got time for a very last question. I think, I think we're okay, Eric. Nobody wants to be hit in the head by the blue thing. <laughs> so. No question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Ed Fair, University of Southampton. Uh, if there is no such thing as neutral design, how mm -hmm. should we choose our ethics? It's, I mean, that is a really hard question. And um, so, I, I, first and foremost for me is that people are aware. So I, I do networking re research. Every network you design includes certain people and excludes others. You may want it that way. You may be on purpose deciding to do it, but actually knowing that you're doing that. And I mean, I think, uh, so, so, so the first thing to me is just the awareness thing. Beyond that, I think it's really, really, really complicated. And I do, I do feel that um, you see, uh, and this is, I think, where libraries can get involved as well hugely. You do see multidisciplinary groups coming together around AI and ethics now much more um, and, and dealing with those thorny issues. And there isn't a short, answer in this, you know, and I think even like, as I said, when I looked at that artwork on the uh, Amazon Echo, I'm there at home still <laughs> asking Amazon what time it is or something completely inane because I don't want to look at my, I can't find my phone or something. Um, so so I, I, I do think the first bit of it is the kind of awareness. And I think there's a mixture between a personal ethic ethical choice as well, and the need for us to push more universally about what we want of big business and the companies in, in the world in which we inhabit. Not a great answer for you, but I think it's a very complicated uh, question, and a very great question, and one that we could spend many sessions, I think, discussing. Okay, so colleagues, let's show once again our appreciation to Linda for a, a great you. speech.